I want to thank you for going to our website, firstbaptistwesterville.com. And uh, we are, once again, uh, going to be uh, putting the message on there for you to be able to take the word and, and to uh, continue to worship the Lord and uh, wherever you are. And we are grateful for you uh, checking us out there on that website. There's contact information. And uh, please don't hesitate to, uh, to contact me or to uh, call the, the information that's on the website. And uh, we're thankful for you doing that. Once again, we'd like to see what, your, what, the, what God's Word says to us. Uh, you know, we're all hearing on the news and we all have questions. And we see various things happening around the world concerning the coronavirus. And you know, we can find refuge, we can find peace even in the difficult time. In Psalm 46, verses 10 and 11, the uh, New American Standard Bible says, Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. We can find comfort in knowing that the Lord of hosts is with us. And he is our stronghold. And that we, for that reason, can be still or cease striving and know that I am God. And so we want to just go to the Lord in prayer. And we want to continue to lift up ministries that are ministering at this time. Uh, we have within the Southern Baptist the disaster relief that is very active in helping. And uh, also, as we looked at last time, a letter from Samaritan's Purse and the work they're doing with a, a mobile hospital unit in uh, Italy with the coronavirus there and helping in a team of doctors, nurses, and respiratory therapists. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as your word says, you are with us and you are our stronghold. And Lord, for that reason, we can be still we can cease striving and know that you are God. You are in control. Nothing takes you by surprise. And we are grateful that you are all powerful. Lord, as we think about even around the world, so many dealing with the effects of the coronavirus, and Lord, we do come to you and we ask. We ask, Lord, your healing touch upon those that are suffering and those that are very ill in intensive care units. We pray for families of those that have lost loved ones. We pray for the doctors, the nurses, respiratory therapists, and each one that in the emergency rooms and in the intensive care units in various parts of the in the hospitals all across the land and even around the world. Lord, the skills you've given them. But once again, we come to you, Lord, and we thank you for who you are. Thank you for your assurance that we can be still and know and that you are with us, Lord. Lord, we pray for the disaster relief ministries that are working across even our country. And Lord, we pray for Samaritan's Purse and the ministry going on even with this portable hospital that is set up in Italy and for the mission teams that have went there to help the medical missions, Lord, and we pray. And we pray for many to come to know you as the Lord and Savior, even through this. And Lord, I pray that we would be attentive of where you're working as an invitation to join you. And being able to help and, and to look out for our neighbors. To help those around us with any needs that they have. To serve you 
by reaching out to others in your name. Help us tonight, we pray, as we would look into your word and we pray, Father, that whenever this message is viewed, Lord, we thank you as the work of the Holy Spirit taking the word, speaking to our hearts. Enable me to present this message clearly, I pray. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In the last message, we were looking in Mark 14, and we were seeing where Jesus was arrested in the garden. And as they bound him, and now they're taking him, first of all, as the Gospel of John says, they take him to Annas' residence. Annas had been the high priest, but Pilate's predecessor actually deposed him and put Caiaphas as the high priest who was uh, Annas' son-in-law. And so the Bible says that Jesus was first of all taken before Annas, but then they led him to before Caiaphas. And so in this message today, before the high priest rejected, as we continue looking about the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, we're going to see in the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, beginning with verse 53, Christ before Caiaphas. The Bible says, They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. So the council, known as the Sanhedrin, assembled. They're all together there at Caiaphas' house. And all this is taking place, it's believed to be about 3 o'clock in the morning. There were so many things about this trial, in a sense, before Caiaphas that are illegal, even according to the Jewish law. But they ignored that because they did not want to have an uprising from the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all these things happening, even though they were violating the law. Jesus had prophesied to his disciples that he would be brought before the Jewish leaders. You can see in Mark 8, 31, and also in the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 34, Jesus prepared them and said that he would be brought before the Jewish leaders, just like we see is going to be happening in this passage. Dr. Elmer Towns, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, Believe and Live, wrote the following. From a legal standpoint, the trial of Jesus was a farce. The very ones who laid great claims to upholding the law were guilty of its grossest violation. We see, picking up in verse 55, the council kept seeking testimony against Jesus. The Bible says, now the chief priest and the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death. And they were not finding any, for many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. The Jewish law required that two witnesses had to be in agreement. In order to bring an accusation against someone, there had to be the two witnesses. And so the Bible is recording that they were various one making accusations, but they were not even able to be corroborated. They couldn't even do that in the midst of the trial. But then they said, some stood up and began to give false testimony against Jesus saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands and in three days I will build another made without hands. But not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. They thought that Jesus was talking about Herod's temple. They thought that Jesus was saying, destroy this temple, and in three days, but we would know later on from the Gospel of John that Jesus was referring to himself, his own body, that he would be, but on three days he'd be raised again. And even after the resurrection, the disciples remember Jesus' statement in the Gospel of John that's recorded. 
The destruction of a worship place was a capital offense in the ancient world. So they thought, oh, we're going to get Jesus on this. Very fact of what he was saying, even though he wasn't talking about the physical temple, of being that, you know, destroying that and then three days raising that up. So they're having trouble. They cannot get witnesses against Jesus. So verse 60 says that Caiaphas himself questioned Jesus. The Bible says the high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus saying, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. He kept silent. Jesus was fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures, the prophecies. Isaiah 53 and verse 7 said that Jesus would be silent even before his accusers. Even as that sheep is before the slaughter. Jesus remained silent. But then Caiaphas is going to ask him this question. The Bible says he was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? The word one is in italics, it, it means it's been added. Literally, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. Now friend, that is a claim here of deity. Jesus is saying, I am the great name of Jehovah. I am that I am. Jesus is claiming deity. I am and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. He's going to be quoting from Psalm 110 and verse 1, and coming with the clouds of heaven, and also from Daniel 7, 13, and 14. So Jesus answered Caiaphas' question by saying, yes, I am the Christ. I am the Son of the Blessed. I am God. We can tell that they understood his claims because of the reaction. What does Caiaphas, the high priest, do as he hears Jesus clearly say, indeed, I am the Messiah? Well, the Bible says, tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further need do we have of witnesses? The Jews, what they would do when they heard somebody in a blasphemy, they would tear their clothing as a sign that they have heard blasphemy. But Jesus indeed is the Son of God. They would not believe in him. You know, the, the reality is Christ affirmed that he was the Messiah and assured his judges that he was also the coming judge of all mankind. The Bible says that all judgment has been entrusted to the Son. In the Gospel of John, chapter 5, we see that. Because Jesus is the rightful one. Do you realize that everybody will meet Jesus Christ? They will either see him as their Savior and Lord, or they will stand before him, and he is the righteous judge. You can see that reference where all the dead will be before him at what is known as the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Tell us about that judgment. Whether they're rich, poor, famous, those that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ will stand before him, and he is the righteous judge. It 
So the council condemned Jesus. As Caiaphas tears his clothes and says, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. And then verse 65, we see the despicable treatment of Jesus. Some began to spit at him. That was the biggest insult. To spit. When they spat at the Savior, the Messiah, And then to blindfold him and to beat him with their fist and to say to him, prophesy, who hit you? Tell us who hit you. And then the officers, they had their open hands and would slap him. Do you know even this was prophesied? Even what was happening during the middle of the night or early that morning at three o'clock or so in the morning? That this was prophesied? Isaiah 50 and verse 6 says, I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. And once again, we're reminded that Isaiah is written 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. So we read this in Isaiah 50, verse 6, 700 years before Jesus is born, and then we see the fulfillment as he is there before Caiaphas and before the Sanhedrin. Point number two on your outline. Peter denies Jesus. We remember from the last message that we had in this series that Peter was so quick to say, oh, if, even if all the other disciples leave you, Lord, I'll never leave you. I'm willing to die for you. I'll die for you even if, when Jesus said, strike the shepherd and the sheep shall scatter. Oh, but Lord, I won't leave you. Peter indeed was passionate. And Peter was confident he would stay with Jesus Christ. We see in verse 54 of Mark 14 that Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. It was chilly. It was cold. And they would had a fire to, to warm themselves. And there's the officers. And here's Peter as he's sitting there. And the, the light from the fire lights up his face. And as a result of that, he's going to be recognized. We see test number one, a servant girl. The Bible says in verse 66, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out onto the porch. Test number two. Verses 69 and the first part of verse 70, the Bible says, the servant girl saw him. As we compare the scripture with the, the parallel passage in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, there was much discussion. And so somebody else says, ah, you were with Jesus. You're also with him. And the servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, this is one of them. But again, he denied it. 
about an hour later, after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, Surely you're one of them, for you are a Galilean too. You see, the Galileans, their dialects could be picked up by those that were from around Jerusalem area. They had a different way of talking. We have that in the United States. You can go to various parts of the country and hear completely different dialects. And this is the Galileans, they have a distinctive dialect. And, and so they were saying, oh, you are a Galilean. You, you're with Jesus. You're one of his followers. But the Bible says in verse 71, he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man you are talking about. So as the bystanders said that, he says, I don't even know the man. A recognized failure. Notice verse 72. Jesus had told Peter before, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. I failed to mention that in verse 68, when Peter in his first denial said, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about, and he went out onto the porch. Some manuscripts add, and a rooster crowed. Can you imagine Peter as he hears that rooster the first time? He's denied Jesus. But now, Mark records for us that rooster has crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. The cock crows. In the parallel passage in the Gospel of Luke, Chapter 22, verses 61 and 62. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. The Christ looks. Jesus sees him. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him that he was going to deny him those three times. And the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. Peter was a broken man. He was broken before the Lord. He did exactly what he swore up and down that he would never do. He did it. When we think about this passage, all that's taken place since the disciples were with Jesus in the upper room, since Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, the betrayal by Judas Iscariot, all the things that have happened. And the Lord had told them ahead of time, this is what's going to happen. But here we have an unjust trial. And then we have the denials by Peter. And he goes out and he weeps bitterly. He's a broken man. This rough fisherman. 
who left the fishing business to follow after Jesus, the same one who would say when Jesus asked in the region of Caesarea Philippi, who do men say that I am? And, and they said, they, some say John the Baptist or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? It was Peter that spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he heard, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. The same Peter who, when Jesus was walking on the water in the midst of that storm, and, and Peter says, if that's you, have me get out of the boat. And Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water toward Jesus. You know, it's easy to be critical of Peter because, of course, he gets his eyes off the Lord and he starts to sink. But Peter was willing to get out of the boat. Peter was a passionate man. There's no doubt of Peter's love for the Lord. But in the midst of this pressure, one denial led to a second, led to a third. I really believe, though, that when Jesus looked to Peter and he remembered exactly what Jesus had said to him, I really believe that was a turning point in Peter's life. Peter was trying to rely upon himself and his own strength I can handle this, Lord. I'll die for you. He had a passion. He had a zeal. But Jesus knew what was going to take place. Peter had to be broken. We can read about the same man. But in the book of Acts... And a lot of people will say, what's the difference? What made the difference? Here was the one who denied Jesus. He goes out and he weeps bitterly. The same man God is going to use, and he's going to preach on the day of Pentecost. And 3,000 souls will be saved. The early chapters of Acts, he's going to be willing to be arrested. He's going to be beaten. In fact, when James is killed, Peter is in the prison thinking he's going to be next. He was willing to be arrested. What made the difference? I'll tell you what the difference was. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, You see here in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, Peter was relying upon himself. But in the book of Acts, he was being filled with the Spirit of God. He was able to preach the word with boldness as a result of being filled with the Spirit of God being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And Peter, tradition teaches us that he was crucified upside down because he did not, he didn't think he was worthy to die the same way as the Lord did. And as you read 1 Peter and 2 Peter, you see a different man 
Then you see in Mark 14. I was thinking about this because in the Gospel of John, when Andrew said to Peter, we have found the Messiah. And Jesus meets Simon, son of John. And Jesus looks at him and says, you're going to be Peter. You're going to be a rock. Petras. That was what he was going to make him. That was what he was going to make him. Peter thought, I'm done. I have denied the Lord. I have done what I said I would never do. He can never use me. I'm ruined. He was a broken man. But we see throughout the scriptures that God would use broken people. Peter was going to be able to be used by God. How do we know that? Psalm 51 and verse 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. You may be watching this message. You may be thinking, I can never be forgiven. I've done so many things. God wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. The reality is, God wasn't done with Peter. And he's not done with you. We all need to face the reality that we need to humble ourselves before Almighty God. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Myself and every single one of us, we need the grace of God. Not only saved by his grace, but empowered by his grace. You know, sometimes we get it backwards. Sometimes in our own flesh, in our own ability, we say, I'm doing everything I can to serve the Lord. I want to serve the Lord. I want to do this and this and this for the Lord. And we're relying upon our talents. We're relying upon our own abilities. We're relying upon our own strength. That's what Peter was doing. He was self-reliant. It's possible to even do that in ministry, in serving the Lord, of saying, I, 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 I'm doing this for you, Lord, instead of allowing you, Lord, to work in me, on me, and through me. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord. We need his grace. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Peter's a broken man, but God wasn't done with him. God's going to restore him. He's going to forgive him. He's going to use him in a mighty way. Maybe you heard this message today. 
And you know about the Lord Jesus Christ. You've heard before that he died on the cross and he was buried and he rose again. A good friend of mine used to put it this way. He needs to have an 18 inch drop from the head to the heart. A lot of people believe there was a man named Jesus who went to the cross, who was buried, and whom they even said rose from the grave, but they didn't know him. How can I become God's child? I want to tell you ABC. First of all, admit that you're a sinner. Oh, I'm guilty of sin. And every single one of us are. We've all sinned against God. We've all come short of his glory. God's perfect. And because of that, he must punish sin. Romans 6.23, the first part says, for the wages of sin is death. What we deserve is to be separated from God forever. We deserve damnation because of our sins. I'm guilty. You see, we cannot get to heaven by being good. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that we're saved by grace through faith. And it's not of ourselves. It's of the gift of God that, that, that indeed that we're saved by His grace. God showed his love, though, for us by sending his own son, Jesus, while we were yet sinners. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So I admit that I'm a sinner, and I can't get to heaven on my own. I need to believe that Jesus is the sinless son of God who came to this earth. And he went to the cross to die on the cross for our sins, just like the scripture said. And he was buried and rose again the third day, just like the scriptures say. God promises eternal life to all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The rest of Romans 6.23 says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can believe that Jesus is who he said he is. And he came to do what he said he would. And the C is to choose to trust Jesus Christ. Nobody can make that choice for you. A mother, a father, a son, daughter, a grandson, a granddaughter, a neighbor, you must choose. You must personally place your trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I always like the, the picture that's in an old hymn that says, I was sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. Then the master of the seas heard my despairing cry, sinking in sin. I can't save myself. I can't do enough good works to get to heaven. I need rescued. I need the master of the seas, the Lord, to hear my cry. And when I really believe in my heart and call out to him, he will hear me and he will save me. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right where you are, I invite you to say something like this to him. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, to be your Lord and Savior, to be forgiven. 
And the reality is, he knows your heart. And if the Holy Spirit, some people describe it as a tugging at your heart. That is the work of the Holy Spirit showing you your need to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can pray something like this. Oh, Lord Jesus, right now, I admit I am a sinner. And because I'm guilty of sin, I deserve damnation. But I believe you are the sinless Son of God. And you came to this earth to go to the cross and to die for me. Right now, I choose to call out to you and say, Lord Jesus, will you come into my life and forgive me of my sins and be my Lord and Savior? Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Maybe you prayed that. Would you please call me or contact me on the information on the website at firstbaptistwesterville.com? You know, the Bible says that we're to let somebody know. We're to confess him before men. And I would rejoice with you. That's the most important decision that you can make. Here in the sanctuary at First Baptist Church, typically at the end of the message, I'll give what is called an altar call. I believe that with the message, we must have an opportunity to respond to what God's doing. You may know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And the Holy Spirit, He may be showing you there's some area in your life that you're relying upon yourself. I, I think that I can do this my own strength. Friend, we'll do just like what Peter did. We'll fail him when we rely upon our own self. Wherever you are watching this, you can make that an altar, a place of prayer, a place of surrender. To say, Lord, I'm guilty of doing the same thing that Peter did. And I need your grace. I need you to empower me. Maybe there's spiritual pride there. God resists pride, the pride, but he gives grace to the humble. Will you humble yourself before him? Thank you so much for watching this message. I encourage you to look up these verses and to check this. And we'll conclude with a final prayer. Lord, we thank you we thank you for the liberty that we have in this land to be able to, to open up the scriptures without threat of persecution. Lord, I pray right now as you have said, your word will not return unto you void, but you will accomplish your very purpose. I pray if there be somebody that has watched this message, heard from you, your word. And they opened their heart to you and believed in you, Lord, and called out to you. Thank you that your word says that we can be called your child, your children, to those who believe on your name. 
Lord, I pray for the believer to be strengthened in you. Whatever the response is, oh, may you move in our hearts and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.